Our third paper will be presented by Joelle Newlander. Uh, Joelle is a professor of history at the Citadel. Uh, she is the author of Programming National Identity, the Culture of Radio in 1930s France, as well as a number of articles, including the forthcoming, I love this title, A Dress for Catherine Hepburn's Cheekbones, uh, Interwar Fashion, Beauty and the Challenge of Americanization. Uh, she is working on two manuscripts, one called The Feminine Arts, Artist Immigres and Their Communities in Paris, 1900 to 1940, and the second from which this, uh, of which I assume this paper is a part, called Selling Moxie, or How French Women Learn to Survive the Great Depression. Uh, her paper today is Moxie in Action, uh, Heroines in Pre-World War II French Popular Culture. Well, Thank you all for, for coming and joining us here today. Um, on December 21st, 1938, just in time for the Christmas box office, an American film produced by 20th Century Fox barreled onto French movie screens. Suez, a biopic of Count Ferdinand de Lesseps, purporting to show the turmoil of the creation of the Suez Canal during Napoleon III's reign, included scenes of political turmoil, love affairs, and desert storms. Two women loved de Lesseps, both romance, romances doomed by circumstance. The first, the Countess Eugenie de Montijo, because she has caught the eye and will be the future wife of Louis Napoleon. And the second, a poor illiterate girl, great granddaughter of a French sergeant, Tony Pellerin, because de Lesseps is already smitten by the first. Both women, however lost in love they are, are able to support France and the future Count de Lesseps in his vision to build the canal. Tony, this is Tony here with de Lesseps, uh, is the more interesting of the two for this paper. She meets de Lesseps in Egypt, um, originally sw uh, swimming naked in the Mediterranean Sea, and then after she gets dressed in this image, they fall back uh, into the water in a bit of a comic scene. Uh, she later dresses as a young boy and has free reign of the French consulate and of the streets of Alexandria. Uh, here, and de Lesseps takes her under his wing, bringing her with him to Paris and having her educated at a boarding school. She, with encouragement of the future Empress of France, summons the courage to keep de Lesseps on task and even becomes a secretary for the fictitious Vicomte René de la Tour, a pro-democracy pamphlet writer who needed her to edit his work. She returns to Egypt once de Lesseps has his funding, but tragedy strikes when a windstorm hits the digging site. I know it's hard to see these images, they're not, uh, it's hard to see, sorry. Um, a windstorm hits the digging site after de Lesseps is knocked unconscious by blowing debris. Tony saves him, you can see her there uh, on the left. Uh, she ties him to a post in the middle of the wind, um, but loses her own life in the process. So he is saved after he's knocked out. She ties him to the post and then is blown, uh, blown away. Um, her grandfather, uh, the sergeant, declares that her death was, quote, in the line of duty. And she is accorded, as you can sort of make out, it's hard to tell, uh, on the right, a full military funeral. Um, buried with bugle blowing, her coffin covered by the tricolor, and she dies a hero for France, and de Lesseps credits her with his ultimate completion of the canal. The movie starred Tyrone Power as uh, de Lesseps, Loretta Young as the Countess Eugenie de Montijo, future wife of Napoleon III, and a French import starlet, Annabella, as Tony Pellerin. Annabella, as you might already know, was a very popular film actor in France, starring in several movies beginning with uh, Abel Gance's Napoleon in 1927, and including roles in films by René Clair, Marcel Carnet, and Jacques Duvivier. Her role in Suez, though, differed from those other outings, as she normally played a kind of photogenic midinette whose demure nature outlined her character, and that's certainly not uh, Tony Pellerin at all, who is out and about and absolutely uh, bold. In Suez, she takes a lead in the action. She shapes the story first through her gumption by daringly following Le de Lesseps on horseback into the desert and prompting his vision of a future canal, by becoming an advocate for democracy against the tyrannical reign of Napoleon III, and by throwing herself into peril to save de Lesseps from the violent Haboub. 
She is a heroine, saving her gentlemen in distress, giving her life for her country and for love. And she is rewarded on films with the honors afforded battlefield soldiers, mort pour la France. This film illustrates many of the points I will make in my paper about women in popular culture in the years before World War II. Annabelle as Tony is a regular girl, unlike Loretta Young's real-life countess. The granddaughter, she's a granddaughter of a petty bourgeois man who has no explicit reason for inhabiting the middle of a heroic biopic. Why is she there? Well, she stands for the possibilities for all young French or American or British or any of the women as they watch the film in late 1938. They too seem to be ordinary women living in extraordinary times. Tony was a participant in the early planning and building of the canal, and like the viewers of the film, she saw the rise of authoritarianism in a long stay in Paris. So she would have been a nice foil for their own vision of the dictatorships that were certainly rising around them. She was also emblematic, although anachronistically, of a modern strong femininity with her short hair and her wearing pants and riding horseback, all of these things. She swam alone, felt comfortable in public milieu, including the pro-democratic Parisian elites, even though she was no elite herself. She joined in action when she was taught how to read. I can't imagine she was quite that good at writing the pamphlets, but apparently she edited very well. Um, the film Suez also occupies an interesting international space in plot, in casting, and in its release. The space allows us to rethink our suppositions about film culture in France, a new point of view that may allow us to expand our idea of what French women understood about how culture might influence their lives. The movie was a Hollywood spectacle about French history, one of several in the decade, including the 1937 Best Picture Oscar-winning biopic The Life of Emile Zola, which was released in France in the March of, eight, of 1938. Suez starred Annabella, whose last role was in Hotel du Nord, and was beloved by French audiences, and Tyrone Power and Loretta Young, worldwide box office draws. The movie also had an international scope, as many epics of the day had. The scenes took place in the ballrooms and political offices of Paris, the rooms of the British Parliament, and the deserts and oases of Egypt. Characters were French, British, and Egyptian Ottoman. Even the success of the canal, although claimed in the movie by France, was shared between each of these groups. The movie points to every possibility of the international nature of the film industry in the 1930s. There's nothing national, although everything national, about it. Suez, in spite of its now cringeworthy effects and themes, has a lot to unpack, and its use of Annabella as a thoroughly modern young woman has many reflections and refractions in pop culture, and more specifically, films with which it competed for screen space in the late 1930s. During the Great Depression, many French women entered the workforce in order to support themselves and their families as sisters, mothers, daughters, and wives. Much of their work was menial in factories, shops, and offices. They looked to popular culture to give them hope that what they did was creditable, useful, and strong. My paper will analyze the, these movies in particular to see how they supported women in that daily grind. Um, one way was through representations of working heroines. In real life, work sustained the household. In fiction, work was a means to save the day, hold on to ideals, and have adventure. In, in many media, including Hollywood film, working middle and working and working middle and working middle and working class women, let me make clear about that, sorry, were often thoughtful and strong. Amateur detectives solved murder and drug cases, secretaries rescued their bosses, and nurses saved lives. Work became more than mundane, and images of that work in popular media reflected pl a plucky generation willing to see itself through financial and other hardship and ready to take on the world. While many historians have written about women and work in the interwar period, Looking at the culture gives us a, a new perspective. This paper attempts to place work in context, thinking about the marketing of culture to, to working women and the way that culture bolstered them at their own, at their own work. Um, an idea that runs counter to a general historical narrative which poses that popular culture pushed a much more domesticated model in the 1930s versus the 1920s. And I don't believe that that's the case. Um, both the domestic and working model coexisted, and often popular culture gave value to women's labor outside the home. And this paper, paper hopes to, at least in a, in a small way, correct that narrative and attempt to give French in, late interwar French working women their cultural due. In this paper, the focus on film and its publicity will also reshape 
ideas about the French film scene, ideas about the ways in which film depicted women's lives in France. If it is true, as Noel Birch and Geneviève Sellier claim in their sweeping work on gender and film, The Battle of the Sexes, that the French film industry saw women in deeply conservative ways in the 1930s, propping up traditional misogyny in the face of a changing women's roles in society, this might not seem to be the case in a larger international film context. After all, as an analysis of one film, Suez begins to show French women and even French actresses did not operate in a simple national context. Colin Crisp, movie uh, historian and, and analyst, shows us that more than half of the movies on French screens came from elsewhere, and most of those were the product of Hollywood. In 1938, the same year as Suez, for example, of the 426 films that appeared on French screens, only 122 were French, while 239 were from the massive output of the Hollywood studio system. By comparison, in much smaller numbers, 21 from, came from England, 26 from Germany, and 5 from Italy. While French women may have preferred their own language and their own product, they were certainly never limited in the way uh, we mostly are today to that product. And to assume that film culture excluded outside influence for its audiences would be an enormous error. So here I'd like to look more closely, just to begin the conversation, at a couple more Hollywood films that starred French actresses and might challenge our assumptions about how fictional women controlled their destinies and appealed to French women. And then I will turn briefly, well I won't have time, uh, to some iconic performances or performers, ones that were viewed by French women with enthusiasm and may have had an influence that corrected a more paternalistic French cinema and been more reflective of the gumption that women showed in their daily lives. So which friends uh, made the jump over uh, the Atlantic to American films? Three of the biggest uh, that were working in France jumped in the late 30s, Danielle Darieux, Annabella, and Mireille Balin as well as several others, including the young actress Olympe Radna, who later became an American citizen, and Lily Pons, a French opera singer who wanted to try her hand at movies in Hollywood. Danielle Darieux was the most celebrated of these in France, starring in major pictures and heading the list of favorite stars in a poll in La Cinéma Grato Cinematographie Française in 1937. Annabella came in as the second favorite um, and both starred in English uh, language features in 1937 and 1938. Uh, here, this is an image from the movie fan magazine, Pour Vous. We see a collected French force in Hollywood around the table. Annabella is there, Danielle Darieux, Mireille Balin, Balin and others, together for an, an evening an evening party. And the magazine constantly featured sort of columns that talked about the actresses who were in Hollywood at the time and what movies uh, and what movies they, they were, were playing in. The stars occupied an international space, perhaps with less renown than a Greta Garbo or a Marlena Dietrich, although who was to know what they would become when they started out in Hollywood in the in the late 1930s. Yet to French women in cinema seats watching, they when they came back on screen, they were theirs, their French compatriots making a go of it in the most successful and wealthiest screen capital in the world. These movies and stars were emblematic, emblematic of how Hollywood gave them a chance to move out of the kinds of roles they may have been given in France, usually secondary to the plot, often tragic, and into heroic roles, detective stories, and screwball comedies. Annabella, the heroine in Suez, took on several of those roles in English and American film. She featured in a smaller British film that had a a worldwide uh, release, and although not Hollywood produced, I still think it, it de deserves a closer look, especially for the character that she plays. The movie is called Dinner at the Ritz, which we, and it was released in early 1937, and is a detective and suspense film with co-star and suave screen idol David Niven. In it, Annabella is far from the reticent and demure heroine. She plays Rani Racine, a young wealthy daughter of a banker who is to marry an equally wealthy baron. Although there is no rush and no great affection between them, as she only wants to start a family, and he seems more paternal than romantic in his interest. Her father seemingly commits suicide after losing all of the bank's finances, but not before confessing to a friend that the money was stolen by six men and by his daughter's fiancé. 
He has a letter sent to the government outlining his suspicions. Rani Racine does not believe her father killed himself, and she sets out to find his killers, repay his debts to his shareholders and all the, the smaller people who banked with him, and restore the bank to its former glory. She works with a detective who is also suspicious of the events, and David Niven, working for the government to find the lost money, she confuses him as a criminal, but eventually they team together to foil her fiance and regain the lost money. Annabella's uh, Rene Racine is uh, feisty, emotional, courageous, and ingenious. She plays several characters in order to gain access to the criminal gang and still remain undiscovered. She intervenes in the auction, that's the first picture there at the auction, uh, of her family's possessions to sell them for as much money as possible by playing to the bidder's fantasies about the historic value of her jewels and furniture and repaying her debt to those who lost their means in her father's scandal. She plays a Spanish countess who loses her jewels gambling at the casinos of southern France in order to infiltrate the mob and make friends with its leader. She dresses as an Indian princess in order to disguise herself when she must meet up with her former fiancé to get proof of the crime and the money back. She runs into danger and wins. She restores the money and gets the guy. No shrinking violet Rani Racine epitomizes the resourceful heroine using everything she has to do the right thing and save the day. Danielle Darieux, here, uh, while playing a more morally ambiguous character in The Rage, the Rage of Paris, sorry, it's, it's in English, I should just <laughs> call it that, in 1938, also showed her gumption and independence in ways perhaps impossible in French film. As Nicole de Cortillon, a poor French dancer in New York, she's about to be evicted from her small apartment. Her friend helps her by hatching a plot to use her connections at the best restaurant in town. The head waiter, played by Academy Award nominated Misha Auer, uh, would get $5,000 to open a restaurant if he in introduced Nicole to a rich man and she married him. The plot, which would be made to much better effect a little bit differently in 1941 in The Lady Eve, and if you haven't seen that movie with Barbara Stanwyck, please go see that movie. It's so fabulous. Um, the plot here allowed Derrieux to play the screwball comedy, slamming doors, flirting, doing magic tricks, and that's the image there. It's hard to see, but she has a coin in her hand, and she, there's a man who's guarding her, and she uses this magic trick to totally distract him, disappear, and leave the, and leave the room so that she can trick the guy into marrying her. Um, she generally squabbles with her co-star, in this case Doug Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and in the end she chooses the right path, leaves town, but is met by the man she loves on the boat back to France who calls the ship's captain to marry them at sea. This was the only film Daria would make in the United States, but it stands in contrast. She hated the studio system, so she left. She couldn't stand it, but it was a great little movie, so I recommend it. Uh, but it stands in contrast to her roles in France, many of which end in sadness and punishment for the outspoken woman. Most obviously, her breakout role is the tragic figure of Marie Vetsera alongside Charles Boyer's Rudolph of Austria in Anatole Litvak's Meierling, which ended in her suicide, or as Claire Deneuve in, in Club des Femmes, in in which she played a comical music hall chorus girl, but was surrounded by sex slavers, pimps, and tragic lesbians. The Hollywood happy ending provided these women with the satisfaction that while often heading toward the wedding altar, their courage and moral actions would be rewarded in the end. Unlike Daria, who hated the studio system and quickly returned to France, Lily Pons and Olympe Bradna would thrive overseas. Pons, an opera singer, would star in three Hollywood films in the late 1930s. Um, each was a musical that highlighted her operatic, her operatic voice. In one, That Girl from Paris in May of 1937, and that's when it came to France, uh, giving a performance of a jazzed up version of the Blue Danube, as well as a straight art aria of Una Voce Poca Fa from the Barber of Seville, which accentuated her excellent coloratura soprano. That film also gave her a role with plenty of moxie. She chooses to, fi to find her own self, figure out who she is, by fleeing Paris, marriage, 
and the opera to find jazz and love in America. She plays a strong lead who drives wildly through Paris, changes flat tires better than a man, stows away on a steamship to America, avoids the immigration police, and sings with a band. In spite of shacking up with the all-male band, she never loses her moral center and instead rejects a loveless marriage and money for adventure and jazz music with her true love. Pond's movie had a feature in Pour Vous, and you can see that here, the week after appearing in the theater on May 13th, which laid out the plot for interested readers. Pons herself would not return to France, choosing to stay in the United States and become an opera singer at the Met. Apparently, like her character in That Girl from Paris, she stowed away for good. Olympe Radna, too, would choose Hollywood over French studios. She still was spoken of by the French press as a French actress. They adored, in spite of her only starring in two French language movies, and those as a young teenager, 13, uh, ages 13 and 14 in 1933 and 34. She starred in several Hollywood films from 1935 to 1940, including Say It in French or Soubrette, released in French cinemas in April of 1939. In it, she plays the young wife of a pro golfer who has to hide the marriage to save her in-law's fortune. She's willing, again, to do whatever it takes. She poses as a maid uh, in the family in order to make sure things go right. Uh, in a screwball comedy, again, another one complete with mistaken identity and enough misunderstandings to fill an episode of Three's Company. She manages to save her family, make friends with her husband's sister, and keep her man. She's the model of a modern wife during the Great Depression. She stays loyal to her husband in the midst of mistaken assumptions about love affairs. She works tirelessly to support her in-laws, including becoming the only servant in a household, doing the work of four maids and a butler when they are about to lose their home, and keeping a brave and smiling face in the midst of adversity when she believes her husband has left her and she finds out she is pregnant. But this being Hollywood, and screwball comedy, it all works out in the end. And those truly happy endings might be the reason that French actresses' characters served as role models for that moxie. Hollywood changed the typical tragedy of the French film. I can imagine in this movie that she would end up dying on the street in pregnancy <laughs> and whatever. It's the, it, wasn't, it was not going to be happy for sure. Um, Hollywood changed the typical tragedy into proof that gumption could work that women who kept striving, keeping their chins up, could win. Hollywood relied on strong female characters, heroines, and go-getters. They were a part of its repertoire. And I mean, I think we know, I just love all these women, uh, Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, Katherine Hepburn, Dorothy Lamour, Ginger Rogers, Myrna Loy, Carol Laubarn, and others. I mean, you can just list off the numbers of women. Um, they ruled the international screens, and all of them had several movies that would be released in France in the 1930s. So these were known, uh, n stars known, and these roles were well known to the, to the women of France. While the French actresses who filmed English-speaking movies never had the shot at many of these, the roles that these women had, they did conform to these kinds of roles in Hollywood. And even in tragedy, as Tony's death in Suez was an example, women triumphed. As, as Tony's sacrifice confirmed her place in, the French, in French mythic history, giving women a role, fictional as it may have been, as soldiers dying for the cause of France.